Um, the 100 year test, I just realized I should have recorded this session, but oh, well, I'll record it now. Um, the 100 hue test goes through and actually gives you a full plot of color deficiencies of operators. Okay. I should say 6.2. The interesting fact is the one down the bottom. Printing and packaging and industrial applications in general are male dominated environments. Um, unfortunately, one in 13 males will have a red-green colour deficiency. One in 300 women have colour deficiencies. So the odds are stacked against the guys in this one. Um, and just don't argue with your wife about colour because she's right and you're wrong. Um, so when we go in and start to think about colour communication and think about better ways to communicate colour, we have to look at how do we eliminate the variables. So how do we standardize a light source? The object is always going to be the object. The object's the thing that we want to know that's changing. We don't want to know that the observer is changing because if the observer is changing, we're going to have a problem because we have no control. So as we break each of those components down, we look at how do we control them. So the quickest and the easiest way to do that is to look at a device that has a controlled light source and a controlled observer, which is normally a spectrophotometer. Spectrophotometer, controlled light source, observer, the only thing that can now change is the object. Paraphrasing that with the fact that as long as your spectrophotometer is measuring repeatedly, and you have a material that you're able to measure repeatedly. This is giving a spectrophotometer will also measure the visible wavelength from 400 to 700 nanometers. And traditionally, you will get a spectral curve that looks like these for the colors that you're measuring. Okay. However, communicating that spectral curve for green to an operator or to a customer they are going to look at you like you are speaking a different language because you are. So we have to make it simpler. We have to make it easier for people to understand. So that's where the um, people who are significantly more intelligent than me took that spectral data and thought, okay, how do we simplify this? And they thought about creating a coordinate color space. Okay, if you imagine a Rubik's cube, the top of our Rubik's cube is white, the bottom is black. One side's yellow, one side's red. One side's green, one side's blue. We now have three coordinates that we can plot any achievable color. Now I can communicate that to somebody and it can mean something. Okay, so that is traditionally what we call the LAB color space. Okay, where L is the lightness axis, A is the green red axis, B is the yellow blue axis. Okay, that enables us to communicate any of those colors by three coordinates. Okay. Now, it's not always possible to achieve an exact match on a color. It's actually almost impossible to do that. But you need to accept or you, you need to have structured and set up an acceptable range for color. That we call the delta E or delta error. So if I'm to go take a step back and if I say that my color standard is a GPS. So now it's George Street, Sydney is my color standard. My tolerance is, or well, my standard is 200 George Street, Sydney. My tolerance is George Street, Sydney. Get, get me to George Street, I'm good. Delta E is the acceptance around our color standard where the product is still acceptable. Okay. 
Okay, so what does that look like? So the traditional delta E calculation is a very simple, straightforward calculation. Okay, I say simple, straightforward because it is a little bit complicated, but it's one line. And it's the L of the standard minus the L of the sample, squared it, and then square root it. A of the standard minus A of the sample squared, square root it. Problem is, it's only about 75% accurate, which means 75% of the time, you're going to get good numbers with a good visual match. 25% of the time, you're going to get good numbers with a bad visual match or bad numbers with a good visual match. And that's because as human beings, we don't see in straight lines. We don't. We're, we're, more, we're more forgiving with colour depending on the attribute that's changed. So if a colour is slightly lighter, but the actual chroma in you is correct, we're a lot more forgiving of accepting that colour. But if the chroma or hue shift and it's on colour for lightness, we will reject it really quickly. So because of that lack of accuracy with Delta E, the global colour institutes work on more accurate tolerances. Tolerances that can give us a better, more meaningful result. As a result of that, we now have three tolerances that are predominantly used, out of which one of them is becoming the pretty much the global benchmark for tolerancing, which is CIE 2000. Um, ISO has now adopted CIE 2000. Um, G7 is adopting CIE 2000. Um, in general, industrial environments, they only use CIE 2000. In any of our global brand programs, when we engage with brand, we use CIE 2000. The reason for that, where, where CIE 76 is 75%, CIE 2000 is about 95%. So 95% of the time, you're going to get good, mat, good numbers with a good visual map. 5% of the time, you may still have either good numbers, questionable visual match, or a good match with questionable numbers. And this is becoming really important as brands and globally specified production becomes more decentralized and becomes reliant upon digital color standards and digital communication. So give you a feel. So on the left-hand side of this screen, what you're looking at in those spread of samples is a delta E of three. Okay, so Big part of it is understanding the tolerance that's being used or being specified for use. And then ensuring that how you are measuring or how you are visually comparing samples minimizes the variability inherent in the process. Okay. And once again, it's all about taking control. Ensuring that everybody in the process is involved. Everybody understands what is required in the process. And you have to use it, no exceptions. You've got, if you start to go down color measurement and understand color, you have to continue down that path and continue to engage it because you will only see more improvement and better usage of the technology within the business. Okay, so before we go into workflow basics and understanding some of the terminology, does anybody have a, 
any questions on the first section on colour? Okay, I would say that that means there's no questions. Okay, so process control is not just about solid ink density. Okay, ink density is part of your production process. It's a big part of your production process. But it does not govern the output. It helps you control the press process, but it doesn't govern the output of your production. Whether the product is actually the correct color is the final stage in your production. Okay. So in this instance, when you're looking at the densities from the first image, we're looking at the correct ink density is there, but the gray balance on this product is incorrect, which means that the sample on the right has a yellow hue. Okay. In this instance, once again, the ink density is correct. Once again, it has even poorer gray balance. So now, it once again, it no longer looks like the color standard. So density is part of it. But there is a lot more involved in ensuring that the output of your press is the correct color than just density. And that's when you look at what are you actually doing when you build your color, if you're using color bars on your presses, what do they actually mean? What are they there for? They're there to ensure that you can have neutrality on your press, measure TVI, measure, which is traditionally dot gain phrased, measure your print contrast. You're, if you're doing overprints, measuring your overprints, Validating the performance of your press and ensuring that your output is correct and consistent. Okay. How do we do that? There's multiple ways to do it. One of the quickest and easiest ways that people use is they use printing standards. So they'll either look at becoming standardized to ISO or they'll look at Snap if you're in the newsprint side of it, or gray coal if you're in the commercial offset, potentially also um, swap if you're in web, or fir first if you're in flexo. All of these processes are there to en enable you to become a better, more consistent printer. With a controlled process, which then ensures that you have a controlled output production. Okay. But once again, just because these exist, it does not mean that if you don't follow them, you can't be a controlled output production site. Of course you can. By adopting some of their governing processes, you can definitely utilize those on your site to become better and more consistent in production. So to give you an idea with ISO, um, it prioritizes dot value over solids. It does include CIE color targets for solids over prints and paper. And the patches that you would normally use are your CMYK solids, your CMYK for TVI, for dot. You would then do your over prints and you'd do gray balance. Okay. Whereas something like G7 prioritizes gray balance over solids. Once again, they include CIE LAB targets 
for solids over prints and paper. And once you get the, what your requirements are as far as color patches are concerned, are pretty much the same, except for the gray balance patches. The gray balance patches are different because G7 strives for neutrality. Okay. It then also gives you potential to add optional. So high contrast, 25% CMY, CMY, 25% K, 75% CMY, 75% K. This is if you want to ensure that you are achieving that neutrality in production. Okay. So proofing. So whether people do it in this group or not, that this purpose of this slide is to give you an understanding of the proofing process, what it is, how it can be used, and how it should be used. So press ready CMYK PDF is produced through workflow rip. That can be sent to CMYK proofer to be outputted as a press proof or press simulation. It can also then be sent to the plate maker to have plates created. And the same file can be sent to the press for press setup. And if depending whether you're using closed loop, it may have a preset from that PDF to run production. The purpose of the proof is to be a visual representation of the job. Okay, not the color standard for the job, visual representation of the job. Okay. We mentioned before about lighting conditions. Standardizing lighting conditions is extremely important when you're visually looking at samples. In this case, you can look at the same sample on press and from your inkjet proof under day 50 lighting condition which is the traditional lighting condition that we would use for, um, for printing within Australia. And then under office lighting condition, that inkjet proof may vastly dif look different compared to, compared to the actual press print. This is a physical phenomenon called metamerism. Okay. This is a physical interaction of the light with the object. This is the situation where the object, because of the change in light source, how that light source interacts with your sample is physically changing what you're seeing. You cannot do anything about metamerism. It exists. With a spectrophotometer, you can measure it. But what it highlights is you must standardize your proof viewing conditions. Having a controlled light box running with a standardized lamp is the quickest and easiest way to do to achieve this. Okay. So proper viewing, you can look at the ISO 3664 graphic technologies um, standard if you want to look at what lighting conditions are for standardized viewing. Please don't use commercially purchased lamps from Bunnings. You will have this effect. They are not consistent. And unfortunately, you will get very variable results. Okay. So the process control approach, which is what we've just been discussing, so files prepared as per the printing specification, if you're using the printing specification. A verified proof that matches your specification. Your plates optimized for your press conditions and adjusted for your proper dot gain on your press. And then really importantly, establish and run the press to measured, to measurable, spe measurable specifications. Okay, so if you're running your press to a measurable specification, if it's measurable, it's repeatable. If 
you're not measuring, repeating something that you're not measuring is extremely hard to do. Okay, so jump quickly into, in, so before I jump into instruments, anybody have any questions? Okay. So instruments, in general terms, when we talk about color measurement devices for printing, and I'm including densitometers in this involvement um, or in this discussion, we have two classes of device, a zero, zero to 45 degree device or a 45 zero, pretty much they're the same, just a little bit different. Um, are traditionally what I use within the printing industry and uh, is the geometry that both densitometers utilize as well as spectrodensitometers. Okay, they are structured in the way as you see here where the light sources, so this is the difference between 45 zero and zero to 45. 45 zero has lamps at 45 degrees from the, from the surface and sensor at 90 degrees. Okay, but it has more than one lamp. So it will either illuminate through a halo where it becomes a conical illumination of the sample or it has multiple lamps illuminating the surface. A zero to 45 has one lamp illuminating the surface at 45 degrees. Okay. Very, very good. This is how human beings see color is zero to 45 degrees. So it gives a very good representation and repeatability for human beings. As long as the substrate is consistent and as long as the substrate is non-reflective. If I made this substrate aluminium, for example, a zero to 45 degree device could not measure it because it's too reflective. So 100% of the light will exit at the 45 degrees. So you can't use a zero to 45 degree device to measure aluminium materials. You need to use a different device. Or even for example, metallized foils, you can't measure with the zero to 45. If you try to measure it with a zero to 45, it will measure it as black. Okay. The other device that's used is what we call a spherical device. This is used for those really hard to measure surfaces like foils and metallized substrate. Okay, all light is trapped inside the sphere when you take measurement. Okay, which is a combination of color and gloss. And by opening the specular port, we're able to exclude the gloss component and take a color only measurement. This is why we can measure polished reflective surfaces. Okay, but this device cannot measure ink density for that reason. Whereas this unit can. Okay, so the differences between the two, a densitometer can tell us how dark the color is. Okay. And it will reference that in the ink density by telling us how that ink density compares to the industry benchmark densities. That is set by selecting what we call the status of the densitometer. In that instance, you have status E, I, T, and R. Those status tables are all inside the device, depending on which one you choose it will compare it against the reference ink density for that particular color. It also enables us to measure TVI or tone value increase, print contrast, overprint density, gray balance and hue error. It won't measure color. 
a spectrophotometer or a spectrodensitometer. However, tell us about the color. They tell us about color, color levels, color strength. Then they can also tell us about density as well as print attributes. Or we can pull spectral data, color space information, color difference information out of that device. Okay. But before you measure, there's, a, there's some things that we need to understand before we measure it, like pick up a measurement device. Number one, what is the appropriate aperture size for my printing? That's defined in a couple of ways. Number one, understanding your screening. If you're running screening, what's the, what's the screening that you're running? will have a direct impact on the aperture size that we would recommend you utilize from X-Ray. So for example, if you're at 175 lines per inch, um, you can utilize a 1.5 millimeter device or above. So for 175, you could also use a six millimeter device. But at 65, you can't use a two millimeter or 1.5. Because you will get variable results when you are looking to measure TVI and when you're looking to measure overprint. Okay. Understanding your measurement characteristic. What filter are you looking to use? Are you measuring with no filter or what we call M0? Um, M1, which is a D50 filter. Um, M2, which is um, aluminum A, but with a UV cut filter to eliminate optical brightness. Or M3 with polarized filter, excluding UV. So understanding your measurement condition is also key to creating a repeatable process. Okay. And then once again, when we're talking about density, um, understanding the ink density and understanding the reference that you're using um, is critical. The other part is whether you're measuring what we call absolute or minus paper. Absolute tends to be the most common um, density measurement for production environments. Okay, absolute means that it uses the reference paper white point from the appropriate status that you're utilizing. Minus paper requires you to measure the paper that you're directly printing on today as part of your density curve calculation. Okay. Um, and then the next step when you're looking to measure color um, comes down to your illumination and your observer angle. Traditionally within print and packaging, we do use D52 degrees. And then you do need to confirm the color space and the delta E method that you're going to utilize for your calculation. So in this case, you can see we're using delta E76. Um, and we're using CIE, LAB, D52 degrees with M0, no filter, as our measurement condition. This becomes important when you want to communicate a colour to somebody else outside of your workflow. You need to, part of that communication needs to be the measurement condition around my LAB coordinates. Similarly, if somebody wants to send you information, you need to understand this to make the data relative and make it relevant. Okay, so one of the last topics we'll cover today comes down to backing materials. What's good, what's, what's useful of measuring a material if you're measuring it over a black bench and if you hold the sample up to the light and you can see your fingers through the back of it, that means that the sample's, sub, the sample's transparent. 
So any light that passes through it from the spectrophotometer is going to bench off, bounce off the bench below it and reflect back into the sample. So if you measure your sample over a black bench, it's going to measure darker than if you measured it over a white bench. Okay, so depending once again on what you're using, ISO provide LAB coordinates for their approved black and white backing materials. Okay, in production, black backing materials um, do tend to be better to be used, primarily because it's easier to keep clean. Plus it gives them a better opacity to measure on. We do not recommend you measure on stacks of press sheets for a couple of reasons. Number one, if your press sheets are optically enhanced, you're just going to stack the optical brightener impact on the product. Okay. And then lastly, ensuring that your device is calibrated daily, cleaned, maintained, and ensuring that you do produce um, consistent results is important. Okay, so this brings um, basically our first session to an end. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Let me check. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, so if anybody has any questions between now and the next session, please feel free. Um, my email address is davidstead at xright.com. You can flick me an email and say, what do I do with this? I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, the next session will focus on the printing, printing press control side of things a bit more, where we'll look at what, what is TVI, um, what is print contrast, what is hue error, what is gray balance, and how do you measure it, um, and what do you expect to see, and the effect that that then has on production. Okay, so in the meantime, please feel free to reach out to your ball and dogget contacts if you have any questions, or you can reach out to me directly. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you.